everyone and welcome to Playlist Pages. Today is part 2 of my summary and analysis videos on Dracula. Last time we talked about chapters 1 to 4, so today let's continue straight away with chapter 5, so please make sure to watch the last video. This chapter begins with a slight disappointment because we find out that actually we don't get to know what happens to Jonathan. We dive into the backstory. We ended on a cliffhanger last time, so this time it serves as a very big break in pace. However, these chapters are actually equally important because we get to find out a lot of the characters who play a critical role later on. Mina, the famous Mina who is mentioned in the first four chapters, is a school mistress and she writes to Lucy that I am longing to be with you and by the sea where we can talk together freely and build our castles in the sky. So Lucy is her friend but where Mina is a very serious, solemn, genuine young woman and because of how dutiful she is she wants to be useful for Jonathan, it can be easy to forget that she's also a very good friend to Lucy. So whereas Mina is this very serious young woman who's intent on being a good wife, Lucy is quite the opposite. So she's a bit airy, she has her suitors, she writes to, Lu uh, to Mina in great detail about the men that love her. Lucy is much less disciplined and less structured in her her thoughts. The way that she writes is almost stream of consciousness. She just lets all those words fall out onto the page. But Mina is very much more uh, disciplined in what she writes. Her paragraphs have structure. She thinks carefully of what she's going to say. But actually, although these women are different, Mina doesn't judge her in any way. So she's not this boring, mousy character. She's actually a young woman with her own ambition. She's a far more dimensional character than I think anyone gives her credit for. And she writes this diary because I may show it someday to Jonathan if it is anything worth sharing. And do what I see lady journalists do. So I think this passage is the perfect example of her own ambitions. She wants to perhaps be one day like those lady journalists and she wants to travel and see the world. She comments that it must be so nice to see strange countries. So she has a lot of traits of the new woman that we talked about last time, but at the same time, she can be the angel in the house, so she's the perfect wife. And I think this is Stoker's commentary on the fact that, well, women are not just one-sided. Women can have many dimensions. And so being a girly girl and also being a go-getter and like a new type of woman is not mutually exclusive. Chapter 5 is really short and it mainly focuses on the three suitors, so I thought it would be good to just do a quick rundown, almost like a quick fact file before moving on. Dr. Seward is a doctor who works in the asylum. He has a strong jaw and a good forehead, so he's described as very handsome. He behaves very calmly but nervously at the same time, giving the impression that he's usually composed, but Lucy has him flustered. It's clear that he practiced before the proposal, but his nerves got the better of him. He almost sat on his hat, and the image is of a very handsome, sweet, nervous man who speaks solemnly and genuinely and confesses to Lucy that he loves her. Lucy doesn't love him but he's so sweet she finds herself crying. Seward asks her if he could in time if she could in time love him, but when she answers that her heart is taken, he promises to always be her friend. The second suitor is an American from Texas who is young and fresh and adventurous. He talks in American slang and he simply takes Lucy's hand and says that he knows he isn't good enough for her, but would she do him the honor of accompanying his adventures? Lucy refuses him and then he asks her more seriously. Again, she bursts into tears. He comforts her and also promises to be her friend, at which point Lucy writes that she wishes she could marry three men, but this is heresy, a scandalous line for the time. The chapter ends with correspondence between the three suitors. So actually, rather than being independent candidates, we find out that they're actually really good friends. And one thing I really like about Dracula is that it shows it shows friendship. It shows true friendships. The bond between Lucy and Mina, how Mina senses that something is wrong and how she's ultimately the key to avenging Lucy's death and how much she grieves for her. It's clear that no matter their differences, she would never judge Lucy. She will always be there for her friend and she genuinely admires her. And there's no such like toxic female jealousy that misogynistic novels of the time portray. Like, yes, women can't be friends. And I also like that this book also explores the aspects of male friendship. So all these three men are described as having such a noble character that they genuinely respect Arthur, who is the suitor that Lucy ultimately chooses, and they think, well, you know what? I love Lucy, and I can be happy for her that she finds love. Love is knowing when to let someone go, and they let her do that. They let her go without any resentment. And for Arthur, they have no resentment either. They just think, this is our friend, and he's happy, and we'll be happy for him. And it's also significant that 
in Lucy's whole stream of consciousness, oh my god, look, there's a tree, oh my god, look, there's a flower, oh my gosh, I have three proposals in one day, she never once mentions Arthur. So it shows that he has a really special place in her heart. So she, for him, he's not just something like trivial, something akin to, oh, you know, I saw this boat on my way, on my walk. He's something that is really important for her. He's a very special piece in her life. And so it's implied that she and Mina have talked about Arthur many times already and she knows that he's the one which is why she doesn't bother writing to Mina because true friends always know. Mina meets Lucy at the station at Whitby. Whitby is described as this beautiful seaside town, a lovely place, green valleys, a full view of the harbor. But much like Transylvania, there's more than meets the eye. There's a graveyard and a legend of a woman in white. A bit of foreshadowing in what's to come, of course, with the illusion of the female vampires who blink Jonathan so much, and the graveyard from which perhaps Dracula and his descendants can emerge. Mina in this chapter seems a bit bored, so she definitely wanted to escape to Whitby, but she can also not settle down and just enjoy it because Jonathan is not here and of course as the good wife and the good girlfriend, she cares a lot about him and he takes up a lot of her thoughts. She says that the people seem to do nothing all day but sit here and talk. So it's that pervasive feeling of discomfort that you can't shake, like when you know that you should be doing something but you don't quite know what, so you just can't really relax. And this could also be bringing us back to the idea of women's intuition at the time. I mean, it's still an idea that many people carry to this day that, oh, like somehow women can just sense things. Perhaps that's why people before thought that they were witches. And I think it's really interesting how she always feels the need to be doing something. Later on, she even memorizes the trains because she wants to be helpful to Jonathan, as she said in the first chapter. So she def definitely and distinctly has these traits of being a new woman while also being so preoccupied with her husband. So I think it shows that just because a woman thinks a lot about her guy, she she's not she doesn't just laze around and sit around. And I think it was very progressive with Stoker to portray her in this way. So she can't shake her feeling of unease and she asks an old man about this legend of the woman in the white. So people used to see this woman in the window and she wants to know more about her, but he is utterly dismissive. Unlike the people in Transylvania, he doesn't know what's to come. And also, Mina looks like such a respectable young woman. I think he just, well, feared that perhaps she was gonna make fun of him or think the worst of him because he doesn't tell her. But then later, Lucy comes along and Lucy's so sweet that the old man like wears down and he talks to her. Lovely that although Lucy's portrayed as a bit of like a player and a flirt for talking with these three men, something that again would not have been normal for a woman to do at the time, especially because in the first chapter we had that passage of her saying, I wish I could marry three men, absolute heresy, <laughs> portraying her as this sweet young girl who everyone loves the moment that they meet her is a very nice juxtaposition to how she would have been portrayed in newspapers of the time. As a temptress, as the fallen woman, as like this impure creature from hell. And Lucy's favorite seat is actually in the graveyard on a grave. I mean, it's a very strange seat for a sweet young girl, but there we have it. And it's significant that that grave actually belongs to Jerdy, as the old man calls him. So he was this man who committed suicide. And it's significant that he's buried in the church courtyard because of course for practicing traditional Christians all the time, it would have been unacceptable that the grave, like the grave of a sinner is in the holy building. But yeah, Lucy gets a bit worried that she's sitting on Georgie's grave. I mean, she didn't seem to care before about who it was, but she cares now. But the old man kind of makes a crude joke that, oh, well, Ge Georgie certainly wouldn't mind that you're sitting on his lap. And he says, like, it's fine. No harm has come to me. And then a few chapters later, he dies. <laughs> so I think there's also a little bit of a, like, tut tut you shouldn't ignore superstitions in this bit. Later on, Lucy and Mina talk about Lucy's suitors and Mina writes, that made me just a little heartsick for I haven't heard of Jonathan for a whole month. She really misses him and we see that his infatuation with her is not one-sided at all. It's implied that their love is strong enough to transcend distance, like she can view him as even though he's in Transylvania, but Arthur's love is actually not ultimately enough to save Lucy, so perhaps there could be an underlying comment on that. Or maybe it's just because Lucy got 
unlucky and like the three suitors that she had Dracula visited her a whole three times and nobody was able to prevent anything. There's also an interesting observation from Mina. The band on the pier is playing a harsh waltz and further along the quay there's a Salvation Army meeting in a back street. She can see and hear everything from the top of a cliff. Unlike the other characters, she can be both rational and religious. She can be logical and very, and very strategical as shown by the way she behaves and by her character as a whole. But she's also not one to discount Christianity completely. She doesn't just make it a choice, either logic or belief. She incorporates them both into her life and it shows that you can be both a scientist and like a logical person and a believer. And actually, I think it kind of breaks the fourth wall because she's standing on a cliff and looking at everything and we're looking at everything from above. It's like an omniscient narr narration type situation because at this point we would have already known what happened to Jonathan. And then we have Dr. Seward's diary. So we know that Dr. Seward is well a doctor and it's mentioned that he works in a lunatic asylum as would have been the term at the time for a mental institution. And he has this patient called Renfield. He has certain qualities very largely developed. Selfishness, secrecy, and and Dr. Seward wonders what the purpose of this man is because he seems very, again, very logical, very rational when he talks to him, but also he's a bit, yeah, he's a bit creepy. Like, if we're to put it, there's no better way to put it. He's creepy. He collects flies, he eats them later on, but at the same time, he's not like actively trying to kill Dr. Seward or anything, so he's just a little bit like strange. And Dr. Seward wonders in this passage what his purpose is, and of course later we find out that his purpose is to be an agent for Dracula's wishes. He He's Dracula's servant because he thinks that it will give him salvation later on, and he has this very strange habit of collecting flies, and he starts to accumulate these flies in his room, and it's very interesting that Seward doesn't really intervene. I mean, I don't think this would have been typical practice for a lunatic asylum at the time, but he just observes and he's kind of like, well, whatever he wants, I'll let it play out and I'll see what happens. It's a similar vibe and atmosphere to Ward Number 6 by Chekhov, where the doctor actively engages and talks with his patients. And after he collects the flies, he gets spiders and he feeds the flies to the spiders. And then he tries to get birds and he feeds the spiders to the bird. And it's like, if you've ever heard that grotesque nursery rhyme right before, of there was an old woman who ate a fly and then she ate a spider to eat the fly. It's kind of like a Russian doll situation. And when Renfield later starts even eating the flies and eating the spiders, almost like a kid, Dr. Seward is revolted and disgusted, but in reply, Renfield merely says, it was very good and very wholesome, that it was life, strong life and gave life to him. Like Dracula, he's leeching off of other people's energies. They give him life and strength. Renfield later on asks for a cat. And of course, Dr. Seward thinks, well, he's just going to feed the birds to the cat. And he doesn't want to do that. And so he refuses. And later on, he comes back. And on Renfield's bed, he sees a pile of feathers and some blood. Yeah, so he ate those too. Human greed knows no bound. And I think this is also an ethical question because if we can stoop to drinking human blood as Dracula does, what makes this distinction between animals and humans? Seward is quite disgusted at Renfield's behavior, but he's actually like quite calm. I guess it's because he's a doctor. He just thinks, um, if I only could have a strong cause as my poor mad friend there, a good unselfish cause to make me work, that would be indeed happiness. I mean, a philosophical moment, going back to the as existential question that's ever relevant, Sartre, Camus, Beauvoir, all of those key philosophers. What is my purpose here? Why am I here on this earth? Why do I exist? And madness is a key theme throughout this novel, as I mentioned in the previous video. And I think this links back to this existential question of purpose. Is it better to have a purpose and be considered mad or insane by the world and not belong to society or live in happy happy in ignorance, not quite know what you're doing here, but sort of going along with the flow, not feeling like an outsider and having that human com that having that human comfort. Back to Mina. So she starts to get really worried because Jonathan's letters sound weird. It's implied again that Dracula doesn't understand humanity enough to know that just saying I'm alright to a fiance is suspicious, but also Lucy starts to sleepwalk. 
The barrier between life and death becomes thinner. It's almost like Lucy's possessed. Mina continues worrying about her, and towards the end of the chapter, the old man, Mr. Swales, comes to tell her that there's something coming. A storm. He feels like he'll die soon. It's in the air. I feel it coming. But he tells Mina not to worry. For life be, after all, only a waiting for something else than what we're doing. And death be all that we can rightly depend on. Yeah. So, <laughs> so my very cheery sentence. And he also tells her she will be safe. And I think he acts like a prophet here because he can feel his death coming and the boundaries between death and life are blurring so he can foresee the future. Mina also sees a Russian ship behaving strangely and that's it. Chapter begins with a newspaper clipping and nobody knows who wrote the newspaper clipping but some critics say that it actually could be Mina because she's into journalism and she would want to do it later on in life and so the clipping tells of a strange ship that has come bounding out onto the land but everyone is dead and suddenly a grey werewolf dog thing has just gone out onto the beach and ran away and everyone on the ship is left dead so how did the ship uh, how did the ship steer itself to the shores nobody knows so we see that dracula has arrived to transylvania and it goes back to something we talked about in the previous video how when jonathan looked up in the dictionary this word that the villagers were whispering it could either mean werewolf or vampire so in English, there is no and, like werewolf and vampire. It's an or distinction. But in the Romanian language, they are familiar with it and they know exactly what to expect. And I think it also shows the difference between language, how when you know when to expect and your language has the words to highlight it, it's almost less scary because you have the words to voice it and to describe your fears, whereas English doesn't. The dead man who was steering the ship was actually tied to the handle of the ship like this with his hands and in his hands he held a rosary. And this image is very powerful. It could be an allusion to Jesus or to Ulysses or even to the Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner. In the Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner, the ship is punished because the Mariner has committed a sin and killed the albatross. So it could be implied that the ship's crew sinned and have allowed Dracula on board or maybe their faith was not enough to protect them because actually in the ship's log it says that the men didn't know he was there. Uh, so it's not actually Dracula who steers the ship, although maybe he he certainly helped. It's actually the dead man because he believed that he had a duty to his ship. He wanted to steer it to the shores and he wanted to be like a man and do his duty until the very end which is why he put the rosary into his hands because he thought well then Dracula won't touch me and use me as an agent for his purpose. It is better to die like a man, like a sailor in the blue water no man can object. He has also seen a pale and ghostly man in the logs. So yeah, it's definitely Dracula. And I think it's also a link back to those, uh, ch back to chapter four, where Jonathan ends with, it's better to die a man, like, like a man, at the edge of a precipice. So better to commit suicide rather than be turned into this inhuman creature. And likewise, better the sailor drowns in his familiar and favorite atmosphere than be taken by Dracula and used as a source for energy. Later, Mr. Swales is found dead as if from a terrible fright with his neck broken and the Russian consul takes control of the ship and pays the tax fares and a bunch of solicitors come and take the boxes because inside they find a number of great wooden boxes filled with mold, of course belonging to Dracula. At the end of the chapter, the sea captain is praised and buried and Mina and Lucy actually attend the funeral and they find it quite touching but there's a big incident in that one of the one of the visitors of the funeral has a dog and the dog howls and absolutely refuses to go near the sea captain, perhaps because it still feels the influence of Dracula on his body. And then the owner, it's so cruel, the owner just drags the dog on top of the grave and then instantly the dog is subdued and lies down with his like head on his paws. The animal is so susceptible to this magic that it just it's almost like depression, it just doesn't want to carry on knowing the horrors that it has witnessed. Perhaps that is why the dogs howl later on. Animals can sense what the humans can't. And uh, Mina, witnessing all of these frightening events, thinks that Lucy is going to sleep even worse now. She's probably going to sleepwalk and have nightmares. Better to tire her out. And she goes onto the cliffs. And in chapter 8, the exact opposite happens. Mina and Lucy have a hearty appetite that should have shocked the new woman, and when they later go to bed, Lucy looks so sweet that Mina thinks Arthur would have loved her all over again, and she also thinks that everyone should 
uh, should have seen their significant other before marriage as they sleep because everyone has this completely different and like very sweet honest look on their face it's it's impossible to be a manipulative person when you're asleep because your true emotions come out so again it's implied that there's a blurring and boundaries and you can see the true truth between the layers and Mina comments that in the future perhaps the new woman would actually be the one proposing rather than the man and she would have she would make a nice job of it too Mina does not scorn the new woman in the slightest again and and I think it's just so nice to see a character who doesn't have internalized misogyny. Lucy continues acting strangely and suddenly in the middle of the night Mina wakes up because she has a premonition. And it's really good that she has that premonition and she walks to Lucy's bed and of course she finds it empty. So Lucy has been sleepwalking again. So she starts searching if Lucy has put on her clothes but she didn't. So she thinks that she must have not gotten far in her nightgown and she goes out searching for her and she runs up onto the western cliff and looks out and she's so scared that she's going to see Lucy on her favorite spot on the eastern cliff and of course she does. Again, strange things happen in the east according to the views of the time. So uh, Mina runs down quickly and heads towards the eastern cliff. There, on her favorite seat, the silver light of the moon struck a half-reclining figure. Snowy white, the coming of the cloud was too quick for me to see much, for the shadow shut down on light almost immediately, but it seemed to me as though something dark stood behind the seat where the white figure shone and bent over it. What it was, whether man or beast, I could not tell. This is a beautiful passage on symbolism. The favorite seat is a grave because Lucy's already halfway there. The silver light of the moon reveals the truth, and the moon is a symbol for purity, virginity. Then a cloud cuts across. The dark evil of Dracula obscures the light and we cannot see the truth and suddenly there's something dark behind the white figure, twisting her purity into something perverse. What separates Dracula from just a vile mosquito? And once again, I think we have another existential question. What makes it human? If you lose your soul, if you lose humanity, are you still human? And I think that this is actually a question that we explored before in The Stranger by Camille. You can check out my video in the cards or in the description box. Mina runs up shouting, Lucy! And she spots a figure with a pale face and gleaming red eyes. By the time she gets to Lucy, the figure is gone and Lucy is left shuddering from the cold. The fact that she's in the nightgown as well makes it very sexual. Dracula represents sexual seduction and temptation. He takes away her virginity. He is in the dark cloud obscuring the moon. Mina is the one who covers her with a shawl. She's the good girl, the good wife, the woman. It is her who scares away Dracula and it is ultimately her that Dracula is unable to take control of. She even thinks when she sees Lucy's neck that, oh my gosh, when I was wrapping the shawl around Lucy, I must have pricked her with the pin of the shawl. So she's so innocent, she doesn't realize the sexual violation that has taken place. Mina is almost maternal in the scene because she's so different from Lucy. She's always the sensible one. She feels responsible for her. I thought I should faint. I was filled with anxiety about Lucy, not only for her health, lest she should suffer from the exposure, but for her reputation in case the story gets wind. Mina is very aware of how important women's propriety was at the time, especially when it comes to marrying. Marriage was a very much a financial proposition. You need your partner to be spotless. We talked a lot about the importance of marriage in my video on the importance of being earnest because this is during the same time frame. So she wants to make sure that Lucy is still spotless in the eyes of her partner. And knowing Arthur, he probably wouldn't have cared he wouldn't have been he wouldn't have minded he's not a jealous lover but mina's very aware how it would be perceived if she comes back with lucy in her nightgown when they get safely back lucy is safely tucked away and she asks mina to say nothing either because she's already carrying out dracula's wishes or because she's also very aware of what it looks like later on lest we forget what has transpired we see two little red points like pinpricks and on the band of her nightdress was a drop of blood mina locks lucy's door and tries the key to her wrist to prevent any more incidents but we of course as the reader suspect that this is already too late and I think what's a very interesting conversation to have is actually what it would have been like for the audience of this time, so the audience for who this was intended for, because we of course know what a vampire is. Dracula is the book that started it, but for an audience of the time, they wouldn't have had such a term for a vampire. So unless they suspect that it's this folk creature who drinks people's blood, it would have been strange and weird and occult. So it's a very different experience reading it now. And a few days later, 
Mina again wakes up in the night and senses danger and finds Lucy still asleep but in her sleep she points at the window and it was brilliant moonlight and the soft effect of the light over the sea and sky merged together in one great silent mystery. It was beautiful beyond words. Between me and the moonlight flitted a great bat coming and going in great whirling circles. This description is sublime. So if we're talking about the difference between sublime and beautiful, there is a sort of terrible beauty in this because the silent mystery is terrifying. Mina scares away the bat and a few days later Mina starts to notice Lucy's strange comments. His red eyes again, they are just the same as Lucy watches a rosy dawn. So already Dracula is beginning to corrupt her vision. Instead of being able to simply admire the beauty of the sunset, she sees his strange red eyes. She sees the danger everywhere and the wounds aren't going away. Mina repeatedly finds Lucy sleepwalking away from a window with what looks like a giant bird, we know it's a bat, holding her neck in pain. Poor Lucy becomes food for Dracula. All the time, the roses in her cheeks are fading and she gets weaker and more languid by day and at night I hear her gasping as if for air. Lucy is constantly drowsy and Mina outlines those symptoms in her journal and her journal is broken only by correspondence between two solicitors who are tasked with the job of delivering Dracula's 50 boxes of coffin <laughs> to his new estate in Carfax. Lucy also talks about her sleepwalking. I didn't quite dream but it all seemed to be real. Something very sweet and very bitter all around me at once, presumably as Dracula drinks her blood. My soul seemed to go out from my body and float about in the air. Again we see how the boundaries between life and death become blurred and how Dracula's hypnosis is a sweet temptation with devastating consequences. And then shock. Jonathan is alive. This whole pace of poor Lucy, oh my god, she's being used, is broken down by the appearance of Jonathan. Some woman called Sister Agatha, of course, a nurse and a nun, writes that they have found Jonathan Harker, he has a brain fever, in his delirium his ravings have been dreadful, of wolves and poison and blood, of ghosts and demons, and I fear to say of what. Mina is of course going to travel to Jonathan's side and make sure that after his hospital release she can treat him as a good wife should. She's hesitant to leave Lucy, but Lucy urges her to go. After that, the final bit of this chapter is an excerpt of Dr. Seward's diary once more. Renfield is overtaken by some mania. It looks like religious mania. He will soon think he is God. These infinite small distinctions between man and man are too paltry for an omnipotent being. How these madmen give themselves away. The real God taketh heed lest a sparrow fall, but the God created from human vanity sees no difference between an ego and a sparrow. So here we see a bit of Dr. Seward's character. He believes that no one can be God other than God, and for him the figure of God is a figure that's kind and that's just. So he believes in Christianity. These are the values that Christianity wants to outline. This is why humans cannot imitate him because we are imperfect and this is ultimately why Dracula fails at the end. Again we see the theme of Christian salvation and how uh, how modernity is not the only solution, how you can be a religious man but still go back to those old values. And Dr. Seward tries to channel those very same values in his everyday life. He's the perfect Christian man, he's quite a catch, it, we feel very sympathetic for him that Lucy didn't pick him because he genuinely wants to be kind and sweet to everyone and he reflects on his experience with Lucy and of course he feels so sad that he wants that he wants to take chloro chloro that's chlorohydrate that was taken at the time in asylums like a sleeping trot but he thinks that it will sully his perfect memory of Lucy so he chooses not to take it uh, suddenly news come that Renfield has escaped and we discover that they are next to Carfax <gasps> Of course, Dracula's estate, Dracula's influence. Dr. Seward sees Renfield talking behind the iron door and he says that he will do the bidding of Dracula and be his slave and wait for the distribution, aka his reward. So ultimately it is his greed that kills him and drives him to insanity. But actually Renfield later on, spoiler alert, dies nobly, saving the woman. This chapter ends with Renfield being restrained and brought back to the hospital. Mina travels to Jonathan and finds him a wreck of himself. He does not remember anything that has happened to him for a long time past, but he remembers her as his wife, and as soon as she sees him, he asks her to share my ignorance and read his journal, but never tell him about what happened unless the situation is desperate. He asks her also to marry him, and she directly quotes from him because his words are so important to her. Then as her wedding present, she takes the journal and she seals it with her ring as the wax stamp, and she ties it with a blue ribbon, and blue 
blue usually signifies sadness because of course the journal will have to be opened but it's actually implied that their marriage is strong enough to withstand the sadness and also secondly i think this goes back to the idea of something new something old something borrowed something blue that is typically used in weddings so this is why she chooses the journal as a wedding present of course the irony is that they choose the exact thing that they will have to open but the main thing is both of them trust each other and their bond lives on we have already violated that trust somehow which does not feel great as the reader because we have read the contents of that journal before Mina but Mina promises Jonathan that she's the happiest woman in the world and gives herself to him with a solemn pledge Lucy responds joyfully to Mina's letter, writing happily of her own news because Arthur has arrived. Cut to an excerpt of Dr. Seward's diary with Renfield. Renfield is behaving quite strangely. During the day he's subdued, as soon as the sun goes down, he's very manic. Of course, we know that that's Dracula's influence. He constantly tries to escape and dash to the Carfax house. And once when Seward disturbs him while he's talking to Dracula, he begins to attack him and he would have killed him however suddenly all of a sudden he stops and we see a giant bat flying away in the sky so Dracula has decided to spare Seward for the time being. Arthur finds that Lucy is getting progressively worse so Dracula doesn't stop his feeding simply because Lucy is with another man and he writes a letter to Dr. Seward to say that Lucy is not feeling great and he also talks to Lucy and urges her to seek out the help of Dr. Seward, again showing that he doesn't care about his ego, his vanity, he cares most of all about her health. Dr. Seward finds that Lucy's pretending to be in gay spirits for her mother's sake, but as soon as she's alone, the mask falls off her face and her true exhaustion comes through. She seems to be normal, she's not anemic, she has perfectly average blood conditions, but Dr. Seward knows there must be a cause. She has difficulty breathing and her sleep is heavy. Dr. Seward does not know what to do and asks his friend Van Helsing from Amsterdam to come see her and give his expert opinion, because there seems to be no medical explanation. Again, just science is insufficient. And we also get introduced to Van Helsing as a character the kindliest and truest heart that beats and his views are as why this is all embracing sympathy. He's a philosopher and a metaphysician and he understands things outside the world that we are used to. After his examination of Lucy where he demonstrates his skill as a doctor, he calms Lucy very easily. He he tells Seward that there is no explainable reason for her condition, but he does ask to keep him updated. Two reasons. First of all, he owes a, owes a favor to Van Helsing. And second of all, because he's genuinely charmed by Lucy. Again, she's such a sweet girl that he really wants to help her. And I think he suspects that there's a bigger and deeper issue, a worrying issue, like the emergence of Dracula. So he wants to do his part and help. Renfield like his master, begins to be more and more impacted by the forces of good and light. He makes bad decisions, sins, and rots from the inside. But Renfield here is not the main focus. The main focus are the notes in the telegrams. Every day, Van Helsing begins to get an update from Dr. Seward, and we see Dr. Seward's telegrams. First, one day he says, she's getting better. The next day he says, oh my god, like, positive news, she's perfectly fine. Third day, Change for the worse, come at once. On that note, the chapter ends. And once again, I think we'll be ending on this cliffhanger. And I'll see you for part three. I know it's, it's a little bit annoying that I had to split this video into so many parts. But there's so much detail that I didn't want to gloss over. And you know, already I have to skip a lot of things. Please stay tuned for part three. <laughs> Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time.